we are recording the event. And John, if you want to go ahead and share your slides, we can get started. And I wanted to say about John that he is one of the most productive and I think um, uh, interesting philosophers around technology today. And um, his book, The Automation, uh, Automation and Utopia, Human Flourishing in a World Without Work, is extremely on topic for the future of human uh, for future of work project that the IET and the uh, Applied Ethics Center are collaborating on, and which we will be doing for the next uh, two years, and that we've just hired a postdoc to work on. So he's extremely on point for this. Uh, he's also the co-author of Citizen's Guide to Artificial Intelligence. Uh, runs the Philosophical Disquisitions blog, where he publishes blog pieces that are actually each a mini philosophical essay written in the purest of analytical logic, which I always find extremely instructive and has a very diverse um, uh, scope of things that he has looked at. So I'm delighted to have you today, John, and take it away. Okay, thanks for that introduction, James, and uh, I appreciate the, the kind words. And I mean, I also do like the fact that you just concluded and mentioned that I, I, I do cover a diverse range of topics on, on my blog and I write about a lot of things and uh, people often associate me with technology and ethics for obvious reasons, but um, I do, I'm interested in, the, in other topics. So yeah, look, I'm talking about uh, automation and the future of the work ethic. I was chatting to James just beforehand. I'm not sure if people could hear that or not, um, but the timing of this talk and how Back in 2016, I gave a, a talk in Germany on the night that Donald Trump was elected uh, on themes that were covered in my book, Automation and Utopia. And I, I felt that there was something inapposite about the content of my talk, given world events. And I suppose I feel a little bit that way right now as to you know whether it, it is meaningful or worthwhile to think about these questions, uh, given, as James was saying, the seeming return to the past and the history of great power conflict. But I'll, I'll set those musings or existential concerns to the side for the remainder of my comments this evening and focus on the brief or what I promised to talk about. I was also just at the outset notice, note that I think Sven Neom is in the audience for this. I could see his name cropping up in the participant list. And uh, some of the content of this talk is based on work that the two of us have done together. So I think I should acknowledge him up front and how he has shaped some way my thinking on the following questions. So I want to talk about automation of the future of the work ethic and I think to start that topic, I will focus on the past and look at the influence that technology has had on our value system around work historically. So look, this is a somewhat controversial historical thesis, but there is this notion that has been knocking around amongst medievalists and historians that there are a couple or a handful of technologies that have had a fairly decisive impact on the shape of Western civilization, certainly, and particularly modern European industrial civilization. And one of those technologies is the heavy plow, uh, which came into wide circulation, particularly in Northern Europe in the Middle Ages, so roughly the period from 600 to 1200 pre, pre Renaissance. And the heavy plow was contrasted or distinguished from the scratch plow. And now I'm not an expert on the history of agricultural technology, but very roughly a scratch plow, which you see at the top of the screen here, as the name suggests, will scratch a narrow furrow in soil that you can lay seeds in. The heavy plow is a more sophisticated piece of machinery with a metallic uh, cutting blade that will actually turn the soil and bring the nutrient rich under layers of soil to the surface and will plow a field into these ridges and furrows that many of us now associate with, with agricultural fields. Um, and had a, or it was alleged to have had a fairly major impact on agriculture in Northern European climates where they had heavier clay soils. Uh, there's a couple of, of these impacts, so some of them depicted here in this, image. One is, I suppose, the use of animal and machine power in agriculture. And you can you know, trace a direct line from this to mechanical forms of, of plowing technology that are more common nowadays or that we see nowadays. 
Um, so the ox drawn plow uh, that could you know, churn more soil and changed the working habits and relationships of, of farmers, of peasant farmers. They found that no longer was it solely beneficial to work on your own to plow a field, but there was a value to working in teams where you had like an eight ox drawn plow that people would help and assist you with the coordination of that. And uh, that there's a change to the way in which fields were um, allocated, so, uh, the allotments that people had from you know, small square plots of land to long strips of land that were often owned and plowed in common. And Lynn White Jr.'s thesis in his famous book uh, 1962 called Medieval Technology and Social Change is that the introduction of the heavy plow into northern European civilizations changed farming from a subsistence activity uh, to a more industrial activity. And you get that in this quote here, right? So that from time in immemorial, peasants in allotment, um, people farmed in allotments that were at least theoretically sufficient to support a family. Although most peasants paid rent, the assumption was subsistent farming. Then in Northern Europe and there alone, the heavy plow changed the basis of allotment. The standard of land distribution ceased to be the needs of a family and became the ability of a power engine to till the earth. No more fundamental change in the idea of man's relation to the soil can be imagined. Once man had been part of nature, subsistent on it, and now he became her exploiter. The idea is that the, the plow allowed people to produce more, they had produced a surplus that they would sell in local villages that would be used to sustain a larger population from and towns. And from there you get the rise of the merchant class, trading between towns, the end ultimately of agriculture and the shift to industrial civilization. Now, Lynn My Jr.'s thesis has been controversial, but there have been some recent attempts to resurrect his thesis. I've noticed, I've noticed a few papers have been passed on published in the past decade that argue that the, the, the plow really did have this uh, decisive impact on the, or fairly decisive impact on the development of European civilization and uh, agricultural methods. Uh, so there's a couple of papers here. The second one on the screen is possibly the more interesting one. It's by a group of Danish researchers. It's an econometric analysis that alleges that the introduction of the heavy plow explains, as you see here, more than 40% of the urbanization in medieval Denmark and uh, other areas in, in Northern Europe. Uh, and so, so from that kind of rise of surplus agricultural production, the, the towns and merchants, you get the emergence of the civilization described in Adam Smith's famous book, The Wealth of Nations. We're no longer focused on subsistence and survival we're focused on specialization and exchange and the economic growth and potentials that that unlocks. And so work changed as a result of this technology. And to be clear, there are probably other social and technological developments that are relevant too, but this particular technology can be identified as, as a potential hinge point or turning point in historical uh, development. Um, so yeah, you, you get the kind of new work culture, work system, and the emergence of the modern work ethic, where work is no longer just merely about survival, it is about contributing to a new economic value system of progressive growth. And so in any talk on the topic of the work ethic, it's incumbent upon you, I think, to include some reference to Max Weber and his famous thesis on this, the Protestant work ethic and the spirit of capitalism, which is an interesting you know, social historical thesis, which isn't directly relevant to the themes of my talk. But there's a, this quote in that book, it's often repeated by people, about the way in which the capitalist system has emerged and how it functions in people's lives, that today's capitalist economic order is a monstrous cosmos into which the individual is born and which in practice is for him, at least as an individual, simply a, a given, an immutable shell in which he is obliged to live. It forces on the individual to the extent that he is caught up in the relationships of the market 
the norms of its economic activity. And so an essential aspect of that, um, those norms, is what I'm going to be calling in this talk, the work ethic, uh, a value system in which we derive a lot of our meaning and purpose in life from our contribution to this capitalist work order. And what I'm curious about is whether more recent technological changes, developments, could have an impact on the future of this value system, and whether we might be shifting away from what emerged as a result of you know, medieval technology um, to an, an alternative social ethic uh, in which work takes on a much less central role. So my thesis in the talk this evening is that work is a source of multiple goods or values for humans in the modern world. And automating technologies in particular, even when they don't threaten to fully replace human workers, as many people allege or argue, they do threaten to alter the distribution of the goods and values that we derive from work. Now, they affect the distribution of those values in both negative and positive ways. So, so some people do benefit from the technological reforms that we are seeing. But I'm gonna suggest that the primary direction of the effect is negative that to a large extent, technology and automating technologies in particular is devaluing work and means it's much harder to sustain the work ethic. Okay, and to overcome this problem, we're either going to have to introduce policy reforms to try to minimize or rebalance the negative effects of technology and work, or we're going to have to rethink things and pursue or shift to a new social value system that replaces the work ethic, right? So that's a sort of long introduction to my talk, but that's the central argument that I'm going to try and pursue or develop in the remainder of my comments. So let me just first ask a question here, and the next phase of the talk is really going to be a series of clarificatory questions and definitions. So what is the work ethic, and what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, just to go back to Weber, I mean, I don't mean the work ethic in the Weberian sense of some kind of spiritual commitment that, that derives from a certain religious ethos. I view it rather as a secular value system in which one's work, one's occupation or job is, is deemed to be the primary source of intrin intrinsic and instrumental value in one's life. Okay, it's, even if it's not the only source of value, it is the primary one and it's the one that you think is most important and if you aren't pursuing work, jobs, occupations, you are somehow not a full human being, not a full contributor to human civilization. You are a pariah or a leech if you do not abide by the work ethic. Now you might think that that is a strong statement or view, and in some sense it is. There are people out there, many people who you know, don't derive a huge amount of satisfaction from work. Well, the suggestion I want to make is that even those people who, who don't enjoy their jobs, and there are plenty of them nowadays, um, are encultured in a way that encourages them to think of their work as important. And if they're not deriving satisfaction from their work, then the solution to that is to pursue other kinds of work or more work, to be more productive in some way. A couple of illustrations of this, and it, you know, admittedly, I'm not going to review all the evidence that would, would need to support this idea that work is taken on the central role, but a couple of subtle illustrations of this. One is from a book published a few years ago by David Frame about um, his experiences teaching a class of 12 year old children. And he was focusing on how this ideal of employability, that the purpose of education, the purpose of life in many ways is to build up a set of skills and experiences that makes you employable, that ensures that you will get a good job from which you will derive a lot of satisfaction and meaning is drilled into us from a very early age. And that even you know, children as young as 12 are encouraged to view their educational pursuits in this light. He talks about this conversation that he had with the guy when he was helping out at a local school. He asked him why he had enjoyed the program that he was involved in delivering. And his answer was that it would look good on my CV, right? Now that's just one illustration of this, but it, you know, I come across this the whole time, which for many of you do who work in the educational sector, come across this the whole time, that there is a fairly sizable majority of students for whom 
the purpose of education, the purpose of learning is to be employable. And they are encouraged by institutions and by society more generally to view everything they're doing in instrumental terms as to whether it'll help to contribute to getting a good job, which will make them have a meaningful life. And also this notion that if you're not working, you're somehow a pariah or a leech on society. That's a very common belief system. Here's just one illustration of it. This is from an article by Philip von Paris, one of the foremost defenders of the idea of a basic income. It's an article that he wrote back in 1990 called Why Surfers Should Be Fed. And it, it took as its inspiration an incident that occurred in Hawaii in the uh, early 1970s where they established a one-year residency requirement for welfare payments. And the measure was directed against welfare hippies who were arriving in Hawaii to take advantage of beaches so they could surf, hang out in the sun all day, comparatively generous welfare terms. And justifying the introduction of this one-year residency requirement, uh, one of the senators in Hawaii said that there must be no parasites in paradise. The idea that if you're a beach bum or a surfer, uh, not contributing to economic productivity, you're a parasite or a leech. So I think these kinds of statements, these beliefs are indicative of this notion of the work ethic, of the, this secular value system in work, which work takes on a central role in somebody's life. And what is work then? Okay, just to be clear, if we're saying that there is this thing called the work ethic, what is it? that it is about, what is this phenomenon of work? And this is something that could preoccupy us for a very long time. Definitions and concepts of work vary. It's often hard to get common agreement on them. So what I'll try and do is just give you a reasonably precise account of what I mean by work, starting with a famous philosopher and his definition of work that I think is problematic. So Bertrand Russell in his essay in praise of idleness, which is in many ways a critique of the work ethic and uh, an early attempt to argue for kind of, you know, uh, socialist or uh, um, post automation utopia. Comments in that essay that work is of two kinds. One type of work is altering the position of matter at or near the earth's surface relatively to other such matter. And second, telling other people to do so. The first kind is unpleasant and ill paid, and the second is pleasant and highly paid. Now, I, I, mean, I think that's an amusing definition of work. It captures something of the truth. I think it's intended to say, you know, there are these physical manual workers who do things that do work in the physics sense of work. And then there are other people who manage them and tell them to do it. And the people who manage and tell them to do it are the ones who tend to extract most of the economic benefit from that labor. I don't mean that by work, though. I don't follow this Russell definition. I have a slightly different conceptual scheme or understanding. So in my view, work is a condition under which human activity is performed, specifically a condition of economic reward. For many people, a condition of economic necessity, they have to work in order to unlock some kind of economic benefit. That's not true for everyone. I mean, there are some people who have enough independent wealth that the purpose of work is not to acquire material goods or material sustenance. But even for those people, work is performed because it is attached to or associated with some kind of economic reward, typically money payments, right? So that's my understanding that work is not any particular activity or task. It is rather a condition under which we perform our activities. So when I talk about transitioning to a post work ethic society in which we ban on the work ethic, I want to be very clear that I don't mean that we would eliminate work in the sense of activity that is hard or rewarding in some way. I mean that we would eliminate activities that are associated with this economic um, conditionality. A job then is a defined role that's made up of a set of work-related tasks, so tasks that are performed in order to receive an economic reward. And, and jobs are, to some extent, arbitrarily defined. They're not entirely arbitrarily defined, but there's often collections of tasks that make up particular jobs. Some people have jobs that are made up of a very wide set of tasks, a range of tasks. Some people have very narrowly defined jobs. You know? Uh, if you're a taxi driver or a cab driver, you, you essentially do one kind of thing, right? You, you pick people up and drive them from A to B. Maybe there's a bit of small talk uh, in the process, but that's not 
an intrinsic part of, of your job. Whereas if you're someone like me, an academic, there's often a lot of things that make up your job, a lot of tasks, right? Um, and I, I, there's teaching, there's, there's research, there's administration, those can be broken down into a further series of tasks. So they all fall within the same role or occupation. And then a task is any activity that is actually performed by a worker as part of their jobs. So that's the conceptual schema that I work with. And it's important because it's relevant to assessing the impact of automation on work, all right? So here, here's something I'm gonna say at the outset, which might be surprising or controversial to some people is that I, I don't think automating technologies will ever eliminate work, all right? In that first sense of, um, the notion that some of our activities are tied to economic rewards. Well, technologies do not displace work. They do not displace economic conditionality. That is really more of a social policy matter, something we can return to later on. It's not an effect of technology. However, technology can affect the tasks that make up a job and render some roles or occupations irrelevant or vastly change the nature of those roles or occupations as a result of, of the introduction of technology. Okay, so you see that again with the heavy plow, it changes the nature of farming activities. So it's not that it eliminates the job of being a farmer, a peasant farmer, it just changes the tasks that make up that job in some sense. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is just a kind of illustration of this in relation to the job of being a lawyer. You can think about the job of being a lawyer could be made up of multiple different tasks. Uh, and each one of those tasks can be affected by technology in different ways, okay? All right, so that's the definition of work. Uh, what are the goods or values that are associated with work? So I said this is a, a core part of the, the ideal of, of the work ethic, that people derive value from their work. So how do they do that? Well, I mean, there are multiple different values associated with work. You know, philosophers talk about values in two senses. You can talk about instrumental values and intrinsic values. So instrumental values are things that are important for getting access to other kinds of values. So the, the, the chief instrumental value of work is income, okay? It's an instrumental good. If you have income, you can unlock other benefits, access to healthcare, access to services, access to food, access to things that make life more pleasant and entertaining, okay? So the, the, the chief instrumental good of work is income. And for most people, that's why they do it. It's, it's one of the main motivations as to why they do it is to gain access to this instrumental good. I don't think anyone believes that income is an intrinsic good. We can argue with this if, if you like, but um, I don't think the accumulation of money by itself is, is a good thing or makes your life better or increases your, your happiness or well-being. It's that it can help access or unlock those kinds of benefits. The thing about income, though, right, is that income is a fungible good, and that you know one dollar is as good as any other dollar. It doesn't really matter where it comes from. And so, a lot of the debate around the impact of technology on work, and debates around policy reforms such as you know, universal basic income or universal basic services, is about addressing the loss of the instrumental good of work and replacing it with something else. And my own view is that it's perfectly fine to replace it with something else, okay? As long as I have the same income, I'm gonna be pretty happy, uh, irrespective of whether it's necessarily tied to, to work. Again, something you might want to dispute or question in the questions and answers. But work is also associated with a host of other non-income related goods. Uh, this, um, these are goods that are not purely instrumental. They're somehow more intrinsic to the activities that make up your job. Okay. There are many lists of these non-income related goods of work. This is one schema. And again, I think I took this from Sven uh, and some works by other people. So autonomy in, is a, a good that's associated with work. We get to do things by ourselves, of our own volition, more true in some professions than others, but it's a feature of, of work. A sense of re respect and recognition by your, your society, by your peers, a sense that you're contributing to society and achieving something through your work, producing things that are of value. 
a sense of mastery or excellence over a set of skills or tasks, and also a sense of community, of belonging somewhere, uh, you know, friendship, camaraderie in the workplace. These are all things that people associate with their jobs. And it is more challenging to replace these. Okay, so if technologies displace us from work, we might be able to replace income. I'm not saying it's straightforward, but we could do it. But replacing these other things is more challenging, I think. Now, in the following conversation, I'm actually going to ignore the value of community, the sense of uh, friendship, or camaraderie that you get in the workplace, um, and just focus on these other non-income related goods and income. Okay, so what I'm going to do is uh, look at the impact of automating technologies on work, on each of these goods of work, to support my overall thesis that the general direction of travel here is negative. That is, automated technologies are undermining the value that we derive from work, even if they are not displacing or replacing workers. Okay. So just to prove or illustrate that thesis, we need to start by addressing how automation affects work. Okay. So again, you know, the simplistic narrative here is that automating technologies replace human workers. And that, that's the headline debate that you get, that the X number of jobs will be eliminated by technology by the year 2025. We've had this debate over and over again throughout the course of history. People, uh, certainly since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, people dispute whether it's actually really going to happen. Um, and there are many reasons for why they dispute it. I, I think part of it stems from not focusing on the actual impact of automated technologies on work. Okay. Nevertheless, we could talk about two kinds of impact that automation has on work. One is it replaces certain jobs, certain roles. Okay. So if you are a manufacturer, uh, you know, when you work on the factory floor and your job is to, you know, um, attach bolts to the frame of a car, it's that, that, that's, that's the sole task that's as part of your, your job. It's relatively easy to replace that job by technology. So you could totally replace that role. And obviously, if you totally replace somebody at work, you eliminate all the goods that they derive from their job because they, they no longer work. They have to find some other source of employment or do something else. Okay. So whenever you have total replacement of a role, you will have the complete undermining of the goods associated with work. But total, total replacement certainly happens and has happened over and over again in history, but it's not the only impact. And you know, most people say that the primary impact is more a form of collaborative displacement of human workers through technology. So the idea here is that machines replace humans in the performance of some work-related tasks, but humans cooperate and collaborate with machines on other tasks, okay? Um, so human roles in the workplace tend to be redefined so that they have to perform more machine complementary tasks. And this has a more varied impact on the goods of work. Sometimes it's negative and sometimes it's positive. And to explore that or to illustrate that, I think you have to distinguish between different kinds of collaborative displacement. So this is work that I did with uh, Sven Nihon when we identified you know, three main forms of collaborative displacement. Now, I mean, to be very clear, it's not that all forms of, uh, or not all impacts of technology in the workplace fall within these sort of neatly defined categories. The reality is more nuanced, but you know, for heuristic purposes and for the purposes of starting a conversation, we can think about three forms of collaborative displacement. Sorry, I'll skip over this. Um, we're talking about supervisory displacement, okay, where humans are pushed into supervisory roles. So their, their goal is to design and create workplace outputs and supervise tasks performed by machines to produce those outputs. So you can think about a team of designers designing a car, right? They, they do all the specifications, they make it look attractive, they do research with customers as to what they would like. They come up with the design, and then it, the car is essentially produced by machines. And humans then supervise the machine production of the car. The humans are still involved in the industrial process, 
but their role is a supervisory one. You can also think about them about maintenance displacement, where humans are pushed into maintenance and repair roles. Okay, so machines perform the productive work related tasks, but humans maintain and repair those machines, ensure that they are in good working order, that they're effective. And then you can also think about what I'll call order following displacement, right? Where machines create and plan work related tasks and humans simply follow the orders of the machines. I mean, you might say that's a very odd form of displacement and why would it happen? But it is, uh, I think, a feature of particularly AI and algorithmic uh, platform work, right? Where the machines actually do a lot of the cognitive labor, the planning, uh, the designing of the work tasks. And because it's hard to automate certain, you know, dexterous physical skills, or it's more convenient to hire human workers for those skills. Um, humans just are the are the physical laborers in the system. They follow the orders set down by machines. And you can think about you know an Uber driver or something with a Google Maps and a, a route planner. Their job is simply to pick people up, follow the route, drop them off. Um, they don't do the same sort of planning anymore. I mean, the, the famous illustration example of this is, you know, the London black cab drivers who had to pass this test that they called the knowledge where they had to know every single street in London, which has a, a very complex road network and it's road system. Um, but you kind of don't need that anymore. You just need the technology, follow the orders. And there are many other illustrations of that kind of order following displacement too. So the, those are the different impacts of automated technologies in the workplace. How about my thesis or claim that the primary direction of travel here is, is negative? Okay, that the main impact on work on the goods or of automated technologies and the goods of work is a negative one. Well, to substantiate this thesis, I'm going to construct a scorecard. This is what the scorecard looks like. Okay, where I consider the different goods of work that I mentioned earlier on, excluding community, so income, mastery, autonomy, achievement, and respect. And then I look at the different kinds of relationships or impacts of automated technologies on work. So the three kinds of collaborative displacement that I just mentioned, and then uh, total displacement as well. And what impact do these different forms of displacement have on the goods of work? So let me go through the, the scorecard now and, and make some comments. Right, so what about the impact of um, supervisory displacement on the goods of work? So if humans supervise machines in the workplace, does that make work better or worse? But look, it's obviously hard to give a global assessment of this. It will depend on the precise supervisory role. But when it comes to income, you know, the, the evidence in general is that it's a positive impact. So the people who are in the more managerial and supervisory roles, or the design roles, have a net benefit from technological displacement. They become more effective in their jobs. They get to do more creative work. Um, and so they often earn a premium as a result of this because they have a machine complementary skill that can earn a wage premium. It has a positive impact potentially on mastery, right? That they, they can focus on developing a particular set of administrative, managerial, or creative skills. It often has a positive impact on autonomy, again, because they're in the sort of higher managerial roles, they have more freedom around their work tasks to some extent, not, not always, certainly have creative autonomy. Uh, potentially has a positive impact on the achievement that they derive from their work. That's gonna depend a little bit on the exact um, supervisory relationship. And I'll come back to that a bit moment and consider the example of AlphaGo. And in terms of the respect that they drive from the work, their community recognition, it's usually positive. But, and this is the crucial point I would say about this, the effect is usually elite. So this is a, an idea that's been documented by various people about the polarization effect of technology in the workplace, that you get some workers who are elite workers, who are highly educated, engaged in this creative problem solving managerial work, who are benefited by technology, but they're in the minority. And the, the distribution of these goods across the workforce as a whole is more circumspect. So some people benefit, but a lot of people lose out as a result of supervisory displacement. 
what about maintenance displacement there? Um, again, I would say the, the impact of maintenance on incomes is, sort of, is more moderative, maybe leaning towards negative. Uh, part of this has to do with the way in which we valorize um, maintenance related work in, in society, it tends to be devalued. And, and this um, impacts on some of the other goods as well here. So in terms of achievement, um, you kind of have a sideline role in the workplace now. You're not producing the main valuable outputs. You're just maintaining the machinery, maintaining the smooth operation of things. And that is often not associated with as much workplace related achievement or contribution. Often not as respected. Maintenance roles are often sidelined and negatively valued by society. There's potentially positive impacts on mastery over a skill set, over the, the skills of machine maintenance and repair. And um, a more kind of moderate impact on autonomy. Oftentimes you're at the beck and call of um, the machine breakdowns and so forth. In terms of order following displacement, I think the impacts there are largely negative. Again, it's, it's sort of the opposite end of the polarization effect. The people who do the manual labor, there are more of them. They often earn less money. And so they have, tend to get less respect socially. They often end up with uh, more precarious forms of employment in a, you know, the fissured workplace. They get outsourced, their roles get outsourced. They, they become uh, temporary contract workers without the same sorts of benefits. So that leads to sort of negative income uh, benefits uh, and also negative respect. Uh, there's often a cognitive de-skilling effect here. So when it comes to the mastery over a skill set, that, that tends to be reduced. Uh, less autonomy, clearly, because you're ordered or directed by machines that you, you're not involved in the, the decision making anymore. Uh, there might be some sense of achievement associated with it, these jobs. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to downplay it or deny it. Uh, but again, maybe there's a sense that you're not the, the main contributor to it. I mean, if you're an Uber driver, you manage to get somebody safely to their location. But if you, if you don't, if you're not involved in actually the planning and routing of it, maybe the uh, value that you derive from that achievement is, is lessened to some extent. And then in terms of total displacement, as I mentioned earlier, the, the impact there is, is essentially negative. And one of the things that I've explored in work with Sven is this idea that it, achievement is one of the key or central values in work. And in some sense, it's the keystone value because the sense of respect that we derive from work and the mastery that we, do, we get from our work is often dependent on the belief that what we're doing is worthwhile and that we are somehow contributing to a positive outcome uh, through the work. And the primary effect of automating technologies and work here, I think, is indeed negative and that tends to have a knock-on impact on these other goods of work. So that's my, my, my attempt to substantiate this thesis or claim that um, the, the, the primary direction of travel here is negative, that automated technologies are having a negative impact on the values associated with work and making the work ethic less sustainable as a social value system. Uh, I mean, some of the ideas that I explored in uh, the paper with, with Sven as well on, on achievement in the workplace uh, had to, were inspired by the experiences of, of Lee Sidal and his retirement from the world of professional uh, go because of his sense that he was no longer the number one player. And uh, Carissa Belize is a philosopher based in Oxford, wrote a, a blog post commenting on Lee Sidal specifically commenting on a Netflix documentary that was made about DeepMind and their creation of the AlphaGo system that defeated him. And uh, she had this comment that what was most surprising about this development was that the outcome did not feel like a win for humanity, it did not feel similar to when we conquer a disease or when human beings first landed on the moon. It felt like we might be losing more than we are gaining. And myself and Sven wrote this paper where we tried to flesh that out. And so this was the, the idea that we had is that the introduction of automated technologies into the workplace has the potential to open up numerous achievement gaps. So a loss of the sense of achievement associated with work, 
And there were several reasons as to why this happens because automated technologies tend to reduce the value of the outputs associated with human work tasks. They tend to reduce the cost of the human commitment to producing valuable outputs uh, or redirect costly commitment in arbitrary and counterproductive ways. And ultimately they sever the connection between human labor and valuable outputs. And so this is what ultimately really puts pressure on the work ethic. So, you know, what should we do about this? How, how can we address this? So this is my final comments. Um, and I mentioned there are really kind of two options socially, and this is going to affect the development of a new social value system. Either we push back and respond by introducing policy reforms that redistribute the goods of work. Okay. And this is the approach that's advocated by some people. So uh, Anton Kornick and Joseph Stiglitz and this paper that they wrote back in October, 2020, support this point of view. And they're very opposed to the sort of techno-fatalist or techno-determinist view that technology is beyond our control. It's just gonna have this impact on work that's largely negative. There's nothing we can do about it. And their counter argument is that we do in fact have the power to actively steer the path of technological progress so as to confront these challenges posed by our technological possibilities. Okay, so that we, there are policy steps we could take. We should, we should support or empower human agency, human policymakers. We shouldn't assume that we are being buffeted by forces beyond our control. I think to, you know, to a large extent, the, the, that's an admirable goal, but it's easier said than done. And part of that leads back to this point that I started with from Max Weber and his point that's often made by critics of modern capitalist society, which is that the capitalist economic order has a kind of internal logic of its own, right? There is a sort of direction of travel that is very hard to resist. And we are in a sense caught up in the norms of this economic system. So while it might be admirable or desirable to try and redistribute the, the goods of work and moderate the impact of automated technologies in particular in the workplace, it's harder to do that than we might think. And so this kind of leads to the other possibility that if automation is in general corrosive of the goods of work, why not try to seek an alternative social ethic, one in which uh, work has, no longer is the central or primary source of value and worth and meaning, and if I'm right, uh, that this is sort of historical contingency, right? That if you, if you buy the Lynn White Jr. thesis that productive labor was initiated by technological developments that you know, changed the nature of agricultural production from subsistence into uh, the development of a surplus that you could exchange and you get you know, modern capitalist society from that. There's no reason to think that we, a similar effect can't result from more recent technologies, uh, that they change the way in which we perceive the social value of work and we can develop an alternative social ethic. And that's obviously something that I did explore in the, in the book that I wrote, Automation and Utopia, but looking at an, an alternative social ethic of, of a play or an aesthetic value, uh, which I'm not gonna develop it in this particular talk. So I'm, I'm happy to take any comments or questions on that now. So thanks for, Take attention. So, so far we have, let's see, we have one question and the uh, Q&A, and uh, we definitely encourage you to uh, write your questions there. The first question is, do you think the basic income debate and conversation should be linked with job automation and the future of work? And how is work linked with a person's identity in some system? societies rather than a healthy work-life balance? Um, okay, so I mean, the first question is, is, should we connect the basic income debate to uh, work? Right. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. I, I think there has been a, a tendency to tie the two things together. And certainly in the past decade, many of the conversations have been that, uh, you get this amongst tech leaders, you know, Silicon Valley type figures that the purpose of the basic income is to solve the problem created by technology. And I think it's important to emphasize that that is not an accurate reflection of the history of the basic income movement and some of the motivations behind it. So if you go back to people like 
uh, Philip von Paris and other kind of liberal and libertarian writers about the basic income and feminist writers as well, they would say very clearly that uh, it has other benefits and other, there's other justifications and rationales for introducing it that have nothing to do with automation. So in some sense, we should pursue the idea of a basic income guarantee irrespective of the impacts of technology on work. And I, I think that is an argument that I would like to reclaim and it's something that I've tended to emphasize. I, this is uh, many years ago, but I think back in 2014, 2015, I wrote a, a series on my, my blog about the basic income, looking at different philosophical arguments for it. And none of those arguments mentioned automation. Right, so I, I, while I can see the attraction of tying the conversations together, I think advocates or proponents of the basic income should acknowledge, and many of them do in practice acknowledge, that there are other rationales or reasons for introducing it that aren't linked to the effect of technology on, on the work. So that's in response to the first question. The second question then was, um, could you, sorry, could you repeat it for me? Sure. Uh, how's work linked with a person's identity in some cultures rather than uh, with uh, a healthy work-life uh, balance? So I guess the question revolves around the relationship between work and our self-understanding, self-definition. What would it take to... Um, introduce uh, other elements into that self-definition. I guess that goes to your um, alternative social ethic point. Yeah, look, uh, and it's, it's very clear that the, the work ethic as I defined it as a secular value, value system, it doesn't have the same purchaser reach in some countries as it has in others. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the cliche is that the US is a culture that is particularly dominated by the work ethic. Whereas there are other uh, countries that uh, seem to be less obsessed with this. Um, you know, part of that is probably, probably due to you know, the unique cultural and social history of, of the US, which you can get into in terms of you know, who, who migrated there, particularly, let's say, from European civilizations and the kind of uh, culture that they were trying to, to create. Um, and also, uh, I guess, in the modern era, the relative paucity of the US welfare system when compared to many European countries and their welfare system. And so you, maybe you, you don't have the same sort of linking together of work with um, your, your social identity in some European jurisdictions. There, there are these like interesting Gallup, you know, state of the global workforce reports that come out periodically. Uh, and I have to confess, I haven't looked at the, the data since 2017, so I should uh, refresh my memory on this, but certainly in the 2017 report, you do see a significant cultural variation in terms of the satisfaction that people derive from work. And in fact, Eastern European countries fall remarkably low on the satisfaction that people derive from work. Um, is that kind of legacy of communist uh, policies? Is it a, uh, an effect of their current economic situation? I'm not sure. Uh, the US is comparatively high, but at the same time, I think it was only like 33% of the US workforce deems themselves to be actively engaged by, by their work. Um, and that's not just a, it wasn't just a question that was asked by the surveys, that, do you like your work? It, it was a, a 14 point questionnaire that they have where they derive a work satisfaction score from it. Uh, and even though the US was high on work satisfaction, there was no place in the world where everyone was, um, where the majority was actively engaged or deemed their work to be uh, a positive impact and nevertheless uh, like part of that is a paradoxical effect in the sense that people have a huge amount of anxiety and competitiveness around their work and the sense that they could you know, could be doing more that there are more valuable opportunities that they could unlock so it's not that people in these countries aren't sort of bound up or caught up in the culture of the work ethic it's that they're dissatisfied with their jobs because they think they could be deriving even more from from, from their work um, so yeah, look, you know, there is cultural variation of it. it. There are a variety of historical reasons for it. I do think social safety net and welfare system does have an impact on the value that people attach to it. Recent social experiences also have an impact on it. So the, the pandemic and the huge increase in welfare payments that, that were a result of that, I think has had an impact on the value that people attach to work. And you see, you know, all these business commentators talking about the return to work and some of the struggles with uh, employing people now and, and finding people who to take up service sector jobs. I presume it's a, this is an issue in the US. It's definitely a problem in many European 
countries that people just don't see those as attractive forms of labor anymore and are rethinking the value of their work. Uh, so those kind of catastrophic um, social and natural events can, uh, can impact on, that, on the value that people associate with work too, right? Not just these technological forces that we're talking about. So our next question is from uh, Jim Clark and Jim asks, will automation exacerbate the existing horrendous inequalities of living standards? That is who will own the automated process and its benefits? Well, I mean, um, assuming we continue a lot down the track that we're currently continuing on, the uh, technological system will be owned by a small elite of society who will derive most of the benefits from it. Um, will they tolerate kind of large scale redistribution in order to sustain the economic system in some sort of working order? Or, um, how they have grown up with it and how they value it. You know, there are certainly many sort of tech leaders who seem to at least in principle support it. I don't know, once the rubber hits the road as to whether they would support it um, once it starts to really impact on their pockets. But um, yeah, I think look, at the moment, we're certainly heading down the route of, of these things being owned largely by, by an elite. Although look, I will say that there has been a significant backlash against this. You know, If you're writing about this topic five years ago, it seemed that there was an obvious direction of travel, but there's a lot more skepticism and resistance to that. Uh, you obviously have people now, I can't remember her name, but uh, you know, she was recently appointed by Biden, um, I can't even remember the role that she had, but it was about, she wrote this famous article when she was a law student about the, breaking, the breakup of Amazon um, and breaking the power of these uh, elite companies. Um, and so if people are, like that are getting into positions of social power, there does seem to be a bit of a, a sea change. And obviously companies like Facebook are, have hugely negative press and have had to rebrand and reconsider what they're doing. Will that undermine their, their power and social influence? I'm not sure, but it's, it's having some impact. So my point here is that there are things that have happened in the past half a decade that suggest that the earlier narratives around technology developing in a certain way where you would have wide-scale automation and an empowerment of this elite uh, um, it isn't happening in, in quite the same manner as we might have thought. That said, obviously, <laughs> there's the other economic reality to contend with, which is that the past 18 months have seen a huge increase in the wealth of, um, uh, of a few kind of oligarchs or uh, tech barons, you know. Excellent. Uh, Chris Zernas. Lena Khan is the name. Yes. Lena Khan, yep. So from Chris Zern, to what extent are the different goods of work exclusive to the work world? Said in another way, why I think that a diminution in the realization of good X or Y at work is necessarily a diminution of that good for the individual overall. So if I'm understanding the question correctly, even if there's a diminution in autonomy or capacity for judgment at work, why assume that that will travel to other aspects of that person's life? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think the answer to that is I, I don't assume that at all. Uh, that, um, I, so I don't assume that the negative impact of automation in the workplace would necessarily transfer it to every aspect of somebody's life. And in, to some extent, that's what the book I wrote, Automation Utopia, that was, that's what it was about. It was about saying that you don't have to derive all of your meaning and value in life from, from your work. Uh, the point I'm making here is more that there's a tendency for people to assume that work is what they should be doing to have a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose, contribution, mastery, and so forth. Uh, and if they're not doing that, they are, in some sense, not a full and complete member of, of human civilization. And you see that in these, these comments about the, the parasites um, on, on society and the sense that you have to be, be employable. So, so the danger of wide-scale displacement in the workplace as a result of technology at the moment when we're still wedded to the work ethic is that we won't be able to unlock those, uh, those positive possibilities or utopian possibilities of uh, um, transcending or moving beyond work as the, as the central 
value system in, in our societies. Um, uh, so I don't know, I don't know if that's um, what, you know, clearly expressed, but I can, I can try another attempt at it if you want. Let, let me just quickly follow up on Chris's question here. I mean, there is an Aristotelian version of uh, the same kind of question, which is even though by definition, it doesn't mean that it travels to other aspects of uh, life, given how things are arranged right now and how much uh, time work takes up, most of a person's opportunity to practice judgment, most of a person's opportunity to practice their autonomy actually would happen at work. And so they would, as it were, if there's a diminution, be out of practice. So it looks like you would have to actively create other contexts for them to practice those uh, capacities if you're not gonna have a net loss. Yeah, that's well expressed. That's that's the point I was trying to make, and I think that's yeah. a better way of putting it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Sylvia Dorado asks, uh, "Thank you for a great talk. I would like to uh, raise the distinction between the work associated with the exploitation of resources as opposed to care work. This distinction reflects the separation between paid and unpaid work. Work as something connected with the productivity, and work connected with contribution to the community." Yeah, and I mean, that, that's a good point as well. And, and this sort of goes into a, a long-standing issue around the, the definition of work. And so I, like, I was tying the definition of work very much to the economic rewards. And it has been a bone of contention for a long time, particularly, let's say, amongst the feminist movement, that there are certain forms of work, care work in particular, that are devalued by society and not economically rewarded, but that should be recognized for their their economic value, but also for their social value. Uh, I mean, there's this uh, great book written by, uh, this is gonna be bad because I won't, I won't remember her name, but, but the title of the book is, um, is it who, who Made Adam Smith's Dinner or Who, made, who Washed Adam Smith's Clothes, something like that, which was about this supportive network of women in his life who made his sort of leisurely scholarly life possible um, and how, you know, he, he wouldn't have been able to do what he did without that, and there's many other people who, for him, that's true. That you know, they wouldn't have been able to make the sort of contributions that they made to society without this hidden um, care work. So yeah, who, yeah, who cooked Adam Smith's dinner? Is the name of the book. Um, so yeah, like that, I think that's that's an issue. And so, so, so why, like, should we recognize care work as a form of work and recognize its social value? Absolutely. Does that mean it should be paid work? If we're still wedded to the current economic order, I think, yes, there should be some pay for it. And there should be some recognition of that. Um, I say this as well, by the way, as a, as a recent uh, parent, so I mean, just had two kids in the past two years, right? And I think, um, while you understand in theory before you have children, how important care work is and how important it is to take time off your job to care for them. When you actually have them, I think it just becomes a more salient practical reality. Um, and, you know, James kindly commented at the start about like how, how productive I have been as a, as a scholar or, or writer uh, in, in the recent past, but um, that has definitely not been true as a result of becoming a parent. Um, and it certainly has changed my my value system. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, th there should be some kind of economic recognition of that, a better support for that. There are countries, I think, that obviously do a much better job of recognizing and valuing that through the welfare and benefit system. You know, the US, I think, does a very bad job of it <laughs> in practice. Um, it might vary between corporations, right? But uh, you, correct me if I'm wrong, but like there is no paid parental leave or paid maternity leave in the US. Uh, which, I mean, if you, if you have a family and have children, I think you realize just like how insane that is. Anyway, that's, that's another kind of social policy debate. Let's see, uh, Alex Stubbs, who is our inaugural uh, postdoctoral fellow in the future of work. So hi, Alec, and thank you for joining us. Alex says, great talk. What is the relationship between the development of virtual work and your thesis about the achievement gap with the move to remote work and the push towards virtual work, like in, uh, as in Meta and the Metaverse, 
What is your sense about how this kind of work will disrupt or reinforce the work ethic? Yeah, so, I mean, that's a good question. And I, I didn't get into that. So the, I, mean, I was specifically focusing on automating technologies and their impact on work. I wasn't focusing on other kinds of technology, such as information communications technology and the impact that it, that, that it has on work. Um, I do have another a paper that I'm doing, which focuses a little bit more on this. And I think James has thoughts on this. And I think you, I think you said you gave a talk about this yesterday as well, but I'm over it, right? But I already had comments about it. Um, I left out of my conversation the impact uh, of technology and the value of community through the work, all right? You know, sense of camaraderie, social community that people have. And this is true for many people that, you know, a lot of their friends they get from their workplaces, not always true, of course, but to some extent, it's, it's oftentimes their main form of social interaction. Um, what does virtual work and remote work do to that? I think the experience that many people have had through the pandemic where we've had to have this massive, massive social experiment with remote work suggests that there are benefits to it. Um, it, it there are, I think there are huge benefits um, in terms of work-life balance that I can see, removing kind of long commutes and unnecessary activities from, from our, uh, our lives. Um, but I think there has been a kind of negative impact in terms of the, the sense of community that we have through work. Uh, will Meta and the virtual workplace restore some of that and get the sense that you know, we can have more social interactions? Uh, and that's certainly the hope or wish of Mark Zuckerberg. I'm not entirely sure that it will. I'm a, like I'm a big fan of virtual reality technology. To be clear, I'm not a fan of Facebook owning it and controlling it, but I, I'm a I'm a big fan of, of virtual reality. And I am very impressed, by the way, by the technological developments in this area. I do own um, a couple of, of VR headsets, and if you had told me. 20 years ago that we would have technology of that form, I would have not believed you. But I, I think it is, it is incredibly immersive. And to, I mean, to, to me in a way, I find it very uh, engaging, uh, particularly with, let's say with, with uh, play and um, kind of leisure activities. Uh, I don't know if I would like to work in, in the metaverse, um, but this isn't a clear answer to your question, but it, it, I suppose, We've undergone a massive social experiment with remote work, which has clearly revealed both positives and negatives to it. Many of the negatives associated with the sense of community, whether the virtual workplace will restore some of those benefits, I think is open for debate. We I think we don't know yet, but I, I imagine there'll be many interesting research projects exploring that in, in years to come. I have a question about the idea of a transitional uh, period in which we might start developing more appreciation for <clears throat> non-work related values in life. And I, I take up your point that uh, European studies of Europeans show that there is less of a focus on uh, living to work in Europe and more uh, working to live. Um, and I think that this cultural shift could reach a tipping point. One of the things that's happening is that we're uh, aging as industrial societies. And so increasing numbers of people are becoming seniors who are not expected to work. There's been a, a dramatic growth in claiming disability in the United States over the last couple decades, people who are not expected to work. I think at some point, as famously was the case in the 2012 US presidential election, one of the candidates um, said that 47% of the US population was receiving uh, benefits from the government and we're therefore moochers and that you know, the rest of us should be angry at them. But as we age and as the economy changes, more of us may become non-workers and dependent on redistribution. So do you think that that might at some point reach a cultural tipping point and that we might see a rapid um, adoption of new values that wouldn't valorize the working life as the only one that has value? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, I mean, like one thing here is in terms of, I guess, like consciousness raising exercises that is to say that it is possible to live without work and not, and uh, 
not be so bound up with the work ethic. And, and one way of doing that, I think, is to point out that there are many people who don't work right now and work. And what, you know, the labor force participation rate in the US, I think, is about 62%, or something like that. But so it's already the case that 38% of the adult population do not work, they're not actively seeking work. That's a huge number, right? Uh, what, so what, what are they doing? Um, and how did they derive social value? There's some interesting studies on that. Um, one, one of the inspirations for the book I wrote was a sort of mini, uh, I suppose more a set of anecdotes that was later turned into a, a more academic paper about young men who don't work. That you know, The labor force participation of young men has, has dropped fairly significantly in recent times. And that a lot of them are just spending more time playing video games. There's a study by the Chicago Booth, a group of academics at the Chicago Booth School, uh, showing a significant increase in the amount of leisure activity amongst young men uh, who, are, who are not actively participating in, in the workplace. Um, so we, I think we are seeing those kinds of experiments and possibilities. And again, uh, economic catastrophes, social catastrophes can also be a window into these possibilities. I think the pandemic and the massive unemployment that resulted gave a, a brief window into this. There was a, there's, has been a fairly significant reset back to the old norms as a result of that. I mean, I saw this to some extent in, in Ireland more than a decade ago when we had the big financial crash. Um, you know, the, the unemployment rate shot up to I think it was a, somewhere in the region of 20% at one point in time and then back down to 15%. It's taken a very long time for the unemployment rate in Ireland to, to even approach the levels that it was at before a crash and it hasn't got there yet. Um, and so you did see at that point in time, the sense that there was, I think there was less shame around not having a job because it was a more of a shared social experience. Uh, and so you do have those possibilities, that, that uh, ability to explore those kind of non-work alternatives. Uh, and I mean, those of us who are interested in developing this alternative social ethic should you know, try to study and maybe leverage those moments. John, I wonder if I could ask you a question too. Um, when you say that one of the possible responses is uh, to uh, generate an alternative social ethic, so an alternative social ethic was generated with the rise of the heavy plow. As you say, it just took a really long time. Uh, and sort of uh, uh, organically evolved. Uh, so it, it seems like an alternative social ethic will develop. Is your interest um, and focus on how to accelerate that process or in making the argument that it should be developed? Uh, because it is an interesting kind of uh, question about the speed in which social change happens and how that speed is connected to technological change and how much influence we have on that speed. Uh, there is a weird in the end uh, connection to the events of the past week uh, in Europe and Ukraine. The European position changed basically on a dime over the weekend, uh, pretty long uh, standing, long held values, uh, you know, about Europe's commitment to, you know, disarmament and non-investment and uh, militaries and so on and so forth. And the combination of sort of the Europe, Ukrainian stance and it becoming clear how unhinged the Russians are uh, changed that very quickly. I was so there can be accelerated social change. So just wondering, in summary, if you're interested in the need for change or in how to accelerate it. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's a good point. I mean, uh, so just like one kind of correction, which said uh, that I think is important is. Um, how unhinged the Russian leadership is. Russian leadership, yeah. There are yeah. many um, Russians who are now. That's right, so, so, that's okay. right. So I, I just want to make that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it thinks about the story of the, of the plow and the impact that it had. Um, so I actually have, yeah, I have that book here, like Lynn White Jr.'s Social, social Technology, or tech, Medieval Technology and Social Change. And well, you know, it's interesting. One of the things that's remarkable about it is as how long these reforms took, right? How long the effects are. It's only obvious, I guess, in the light of history when you see these things. And obviously, the claim that technology is the sole driver of these changes is is more controversial, and people dispute that. I mean, even in the case of the heavy plow, 
I don't know if I emphasize this enough what I said, um, it's very clear that it is a combination of the technology and the geography that was important here. Uh, so it was only really in Northern European countries that you saw the, the impact, uh, largely because of the clay based soils that they, they had there, as opposed to you know, the, the drier Southern European uh, climates. Um, it took a very long time. That was probably a result of the kinds of technology that were in place here and, and how you could distribute those, the impacts of, of the technology and how, and how quickly those um, social changes could um, spread out through, through civilization. There is a sense nowadays that we're living in a, in a period of time where it's much faster social changes, right? That's a kind of belief that there's this you know, compression of time, compression of history, uh, and maybe a, an interesting crystallization of that is the, the response, as you say, to, um, to the Ukraine war situation. Um, I am a little bit more skeptical of that, though. I think I think there are kind of powerful countervailing uh, social forces that slow down certain kinds of change. Uh, even let's say the pandemic, that was a you know major global event. Probably depending on what happens over the next few months with the Russia Ukraine situation, certainly the most significant you know, geopolitical or social event of my lifetime. And there are a lot of people talking about the potentials for that to cause revolutions and changes in how work is organized and how civilization is organized. I haven't seen that yet. I, I, what I've seen so far is a, a strong desire, particularly on the part of the political elite and economic elite to return to normal, right? That, that's, that's been the main policy drive that we must return to normality. Um, so whether the disruptive impact of the pandemic will be sustained in the long run, it's hard to say. And that might be just a result of the fact that it is, it's, it's, a, it's, not a, it's not based on, or it doesn't seem to be based on a sort of desirable set of um, events or social changes, whereas technological disruption might be more sustainable in the long run, because there's usually some positive reason or rationale as to why people introduce tech, introduce technology. Um, but yeah, like what, I suppose to simplify what I'm saying, there is a sense that things move quicker now, partly as a result of the technological infrastructure that we have in place and now it's quicker to um, distribute and share ideas. Um, and I mean, in a sense, right, like the, the internet created in 1990, they say, well, World Wide Web, let's say in, in 1990, roughly, obviously has deeper roots in military industrial complex, which we won't get into. Uh, we get the rise of essentially the surveillance capitalist economic model in a very short space of time that gets widely distributed, has huge social impacts. And really only now we're getting the countervailing policy response to it, okay? So the so the, I think and I think it's going to be very hard for the social policy response to reset things to completely push back against that technological disruption. Um, but there still are those kind of forces in there that are, are countervailing countervailing interests, and so I'm not sure what what will win out in the long run. Um, but I, I think that there's a tendency for technologies to develop, get distributed very quickly nowadays, have big social impacts in a short space of time, and for it, it to be hard to reset things as a result. And so that gives you some reason to think that this push towards a, an alternative social ethic will happen faster than we might have historically thought to be the case. Uh, as to whether we should actively contribute to those changes, I mean, that the purpose of this talk wasn't to, to advocate for that, but it, I mean, Yes, I think I think I would, and I am interested in making active contributions to those kinds of social changes. I am, by instinct, you know, conservative to some extent and cautious that I, you know, massive social experiments. I'm, I'm not sure I want to be, um, you know, overly enthusiastic about them. But I think there are kind of policy experiments and, and social experiments that you can 
uh, pursue and to see whether these things have positive impacts in the, in the longer run. And I think we should pursue them. Jim Clark, who is from Ireland, notes that um, the work that the Irish lost during the depression caused many suicides and lots of social atomization. Of course, we've had a decline in life expectancy in the United States that's largely attributable to economic insecurity, growing economic insecurity among blue collar people. So I think your points about some of the rippling effects, even if it's not as directly tied to automation sometimes, but just kind of the, the roiling of our job market is definitely having some of these negative psychological consequences for people with increases of drug abuse and alcoholism and so forth. Yeah, look, I mean, those are fair points. I mean, the other thing I'll say is that I do think there is a bit of sort of media myth-making around some of those trends. And um, so this is something actually, I, I did an example of this as a class of mine about statistics and the suicide rate in Ireland has declined since 2008. So, you know, what, what's the explanation for that? May, like maybe there was a, a an impact. I mean, people thought the suicide rate would increase dramatically as a result of the pandemic, but it hasn't. Because it's, it's worth being somewhat skeptical of those narratives, but I do, I do take the point that, um, like what I would say about 2008 is that there was an initial, certainly an initial shock, a readjustment and, there was a sense that everyone was in it together. You got the pandemic as well. And so there was less sort of this social uh, kind of shaming and blaming if you'd lost your job. You, you couldn't claim that people were parasites anymore for losing their jobs. And same happened with the pandemic. But there was a sort of quick reset to the old view um, that there are things that you, you could be doing to, to address this problem. Um, so again, you get those countervailing social forces. Well, John, it's been as I expected, a delight and extremely educational. Um, I recommend that everyone take a look at John's blog, Philosophical Dispositions. Are you still doing your podcast? Uh, yes, I do. I have two episodes that I'm going to release and I will start recommencing it. I, um, again, I'll just say we had, had a second child in, in September. Uh, so two uh, children under the age of two at that point in time, and that has had a major impact on my ability to get uh, any of these things done. As well it should. And well, keep up the good work and uh, we will talk again soon, I'm sure. Thank you so yeah, much. Thanks, yeah, really thanks for inviting good. me and thanks for yeah, asking me to contribute here. So cheers. And thanks Thank for all the questions, everybody. Thanks. thanks for everybody who joined. We'll be posting this on YouTube shortly. Cool, thanks.